and we're ready to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel with Moms Rising. My name is Peppermint, and I am the moderator of today's panel. Uh, and I want to first off apologize for our technical difficulties. Um, we're starting a few minutes late. So of course, we're going to try to make up some time and, and jump right in. Um, and so thank you to everyone that's watching here. Uh, we have a really important panel discussion. And before I introduce our panelists, I want to let you know what our conversation's about today. Uh, it's We're going to be discussing the importance of the fight for safety, fairness, and dignity for the LGBTQ plus community as our nation faces COVID-19 and hones in on the importance of ending police violence. Um, and so I want to jump right in and address our panelists. Please welcome, help me welcome Preston Mitchum. Preston is the Director of Policy at URGE, which is Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity. Welcome. Then we Thank have you. Megan Maury, Policy Director uh, at the National LGBTQ Task Force. Hello. Hello. <laughs> then we have Sharita Gruberg, Director of Policy for the LGBTQ Research and Communications Project at the Center for American Progress. That is a title. <laughs> and last but most certainly not least, we have Bambi Salcedo, President and CEO of Trans Latina Coalition. Uh, and welcome. <laughs> uh, and just so everyone knows, we the importance of uh, stating our pronouns, but in the interest of time, if you want to see folks' pronouns, you can, uh, they, I believe they're listed on the, on, the, uh, on the name tags. So let's just jump right in. Um, uh, I want to uplift and honor the legacies of all the trans people of color uh, and black trans women who were, whose lives were recently taken from us uh, due to transphobic violence. Uh, Dominique Remy Fells of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Rhea Milton of Liberty Township, Ohio. Tony McDade of Tallahassee, Florida. Nina Pop of, uh, I might not be pronouncing this right, Sykeston, Missouri. Heli J. O'Regan of San Antonio, Texas. Um, and I'm hoping that I have all the pronunciations right. Uh, but it's really important that we acknowledge that. And even this morning, there was news of another trans woman, and I didn't have the opportunity to read the entire uh, uh, post about it. Um, but let me see if I can pull it up re really quickly. There was a trans woman who was murdered at the hands of the police um, just late last night, and her name was... Uh, I'll find it and let everyone know. Um, here it is. Her name was Jane Thompson. Um, and so it just highlights, although she's, I don't believe she was a, a woman of color, um, it just highlights how far reaching violence against the trans community is. Um, and it's obviously a terrible thing. So I wanted to make sure we draw attention to that. I have a question for Preston, just to jump right in. Why is today's fight for racial justice for black people in America deeply connected to the LGBT community's fight for liberation and equality? And also, how is it the same fight? And I guess how, how do those intersect is really the, the question. Um, and how is that, how, is that any different than historically? I know that's a lot. I'll let you take it. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much for that. And I first want to say thank you to Time's Up, Moms Rising and Equal Rights Advocates for inviting me. Again, I'm Preston Mitchum, he, him pronouns, the Director of Policy with URGE and Peppermint. My URGE family would banish me if I didn't say how much we loved you. So I really have to take this moment to share. We work with so many young people and young queer and trans folks across this country, and we just love you deeply. So I wanted to say that. Thank you. Um, so I'm thankful to be here. Um, two days ago, you know, the Supreme Court upheld Title VII protections for LGBTQ people. Uh, years ago, I began a short project called the Workplace Discrimination Series, where I interviewed people and covered stories of LGBTQ people who were either not fired, or excuse me, fired or not hired based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, so that's a critical moment for LGBTQ safety, fairness, and dignity. 
-hmm. However, we also know that being hired or fired is a step in the right direction that requires uh, requires additional protections, like ensuring livable wages for people, affordable and comprehensive health care coverage, and expanding medical, uh, family and medical leave. So to get to your specific question, while we are rightfully celebrating this Title VII decision, the Supreme Court also was ensuring that it would not hear any of a raft of qualified immunity cases that have been sitting on their docket for months. Uh, the Supreme Court even refusing to hear these cases means in short that police officers will be protected and shielded in troubling ways, even when they continue to violate the law. Um, so sadly, with what's happening in the world, that shouldn't shock many of us. Um, so what does that have to do with this question? Everything. Um, today's fight for racial justice for Black people in America is not only deeply connected to LGBT communities' fight for liberation um, and equity, um, it is the same fight for many of us. And I don't mean that as oppression Olympics, and I certainly don't mean that to suggest the 1960s civil rights fights are the same as the fight for marriage equality, for example. In many ways, I don't believe so. However, many of us don't have the privilege of separating the pieces of ourselves from each other because that's not how systemic oppression operates. I am not Black first. I am not queer first. I am Black and queer together, always. So when we discuss this connection, we can't forget who is often on the front lines of police violence. When we discuss this connection, we can't forget the Stonewall riots and Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera and Miss Major, who was still with us. Uh, when we discuss these connections, we can't forget who is often unhoused, who's denied opportunities, who experiences youth homelessness and have compounded factors contributing to negative health outcomes. Um, when we discuss this connection, we can't forget the high rates of absenteeism and push out of young black queer and trans people due to hostile school climates and school resource officers and harsh disciplinary policies. Um, and again, when we discuss this connection, we can't forget the names you Peppermint already read at the beginning of your remarks, Tony McDay, Nina Pop, and the many other black trans people, both known and, known and unknown who understand their race cannot be separated from them being trans. I wanna end this question by saying intersectionality is more than words on paper. It is more than a buzzword. It is more than an identity. It is a politic. It is how, mm -hmm. how we see systems and how they impact us at an intersection. And for many of us, unfortunately, those intersections meet at life and death. That is 100% true. And I think that's one of the biggest pieces. I think when we hear folks talk about um, the LGBTQ community or when we hear folks talk about the Black community, um, I think that they understand that they should. They, we, it's it's obvious now that these um, topics should be discussed in the same conversation. But I think it's it's in, that folks seem to have trouble grasping, or folks don't automatically grasp the concept that there is no exclusive LGBT community without the Black community, and there's no Black community without LGBTQ queerness. Those yes. things overlap and are intertwined in a way that's completely inseparable. And the only way to do that would be to rip, literally tear people like you, me, and other black queer folks in half. And it's not possible. Exactly. Um, and so I'm really glad that you brought up some of those points. Um, next question is for Bambi. Uh, Monday morning, Bambi finally brought some much needed good news when the Supreme Court ruled that the employees cannot fire workers simply because they are LGBTQIA+. Um, can you tell us why this is so huge uh, and some other of the some of the other cases, something about some of the other cases that uh, are expecting decisions that we're waiting for and what they could mean for us? Uh, yes. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Peppermint. And thank you to all the organizers for the opportunity to be here. Um, I also want to say greetings. Uh, to all the beautiful people who are tuning in today um, and um, sharing space with all of us. Um, I want to uh, first, you know, just send gratitude and, and much love and appreciation to not just my fellow panelists, but also everyone around the world for the extreme challenges that we're experiencing as a community. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, just be you and take care of yourselves in these difficult times. Um, obviously, the 
the rule of the Supreme Court on Monday is something that is obviously a mark in history, right, for our community. Um, there's a reason why it's called the Supreme Court, right? Because there's the major decision maker uh, when it comes to um, what is happening, particularly with the uh, with the administration that we have right now, right? That's why there's uh, three uh, different powers that makes decisions for um, for our country. Um, so the fact that the Supreme Court uh, made the decision, obviously, it will protect trans and particularly um, gay uh, people from being discriminated at the workplace, but also um, while trying to um, access employment or even, you know, when you're employed, right? Um, in the cases of trans people, many uh, many trans people transition on the job. And so what happens is that people have gotten fired because um, they have transitioned. Um, so this is a protection for them. But I, I think one of the things that we need to consider and, um, and think about is the implementation of it, right? The Supreme Court already ruled that there's protections nationally for LGBTQ people, um, but we have to be vigilant. We have to stand up for ourselves and really um, do what needs to be done in order to ensure that the law uh, takes place, right? And it's gonna require a lot of um, courage for many members of our community, uh, and particularly in states to where the oppression and the discrimination is rampant and really like is something that has been there for generations. Um, and so, although it's a great thing that has happened as a historic thing and a thing that has benefited our community, um, we have to exercise our rights. We have to exercise the law when it comes to us. And we need to make sure that um, we continue to, to advance, uh, particularly trans, the trans community, right? And, and I think it's important that we correlate uh, the global pandemic that we're experiencing right now and particularly how trans people has been set further behind than how we were already were in 2020, right? And again, although this is an amazing uh, ruling that the Supreme Court did, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. There needs still a lot of empowerment that needs to happen in our communities for us to be able to exercise a right and obviously implement the law. Um, Megan and Sharita, I want to ask you to jump in um, on that same question if, if you'd like to. Sure. I mean, I... Um... Again, thank you so much for, for having us today. This is a really important conversation and I'm so glad to be a part of it. Um, and thank you so much to Preston and, and Bambi for starting us off with such um, important grounding information. When I think about the the case on Monday, I, I have to remind myself, was sort of like what Bambi was saying, to be excited about it because it is exciting and, and groundbreaking. Um, but my mind goes to you know what that implementation will look like but also all the things that it doesn't do. I'm I'm 40 years old. I um, I went to community college when I was 27. I I didn't have ever a job where I made more than minimum wage until uh, 2013. So when I'm applying for jobs now and they're asking for 10, 15 years of experience, that's just not something I'm ever going to have. I'm never going to be able to catch up to folks who who started in a in a different place from me. And I am remarkably privileged, right? I, I now have a law degree in, um, and, uh, you know, I, I benefit from the from white supremacy and from um, the systems that say that I am more qualified by based on, you know, the color of my skin. Um, and what the ruling does from Monday says, if two candidates are equally qualified, the, the employer can't discriminate against the career trans person, right? But for most of us, um, getting to that level of, of qualified is a lot is mm -hmm. a lot harder mm -hmm. than it is um, 
and I think so. I think we, I, I'm trying to be as I'm trying to be excited about the ruling. I am excited about the ruling, and we still need to work to change the systems of oppression. That means that we're not starting from the same place, regardless. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that's on. Oh, go ahead if you want to. Oh yeah, just wanted to piggyback off of uh, what everybody said. This is a floor, and it is a win that we are we have the same floor as everybody else. Well, we can't arbitrarily be denied employment just because uh, somebody's queer or trans. Like that, that's what we're celebrating is getting to that same floor. We still have a mm -hmm. long way to go. Um, but one of the things that's heartening about this decision is all the other laws that are impacted. The Trump administration since day one has been saying sex is sex defined at birth. It is biological. Anything else is incorrect. And we're going to take away every single protection in education, in health care, in access to federally funded services and employment because we believe this. And another thing that this decision means is that that is incorrect. Now, with this mm -hmm. administration, take everybody pushing for them to follow the law. Um, but this was a really clear sign that everything the administration has been doing to take away our rights is wrong, is not founded on the law. And again, it, it's going to be a fight. We are starting from an unequal position, um, but it at least gives us a tool to use. I think that's uh, an excellent point. And it's really interesting that all these attacks that see, I don't even say seem to be, are coming from so many different directions, whether it's via our government, or the president via his early morning tweets, um, uh, or even COVID-19 itself. And so our communities, uh, respectively, are, are currently facing so many multiple crises at the same time. And the coronavirus pandemic, in addition to continued police uh, violence and systemic racism, um, attacks on trans healthcare and, and everything that you all mentioned. Um, how how would you each say that COVID-19 is impacting, actually I'm gonna ask this, direct this at Megan. Um, how would you say that, that COVID-19 is impacting the LGBTQ plus community and what is the impact gonna look like even two years from now? Cause this could have uh, implications that, that affect, you know, housing, healthcare, job security, obviously it's it's had those uh, effects in the short term. What about in the long term? Yeah, everything uh, you just, you just, I mean, the LGBTQ folks, particularly trans people, LGBTQ people of color, and LGBTQ folks with disabilities, uh, face disparities in, in sort of every realm, in access to healthcare, housing, employment, uh, in, in health disparities themselves, uh, in access to, to sort of pathways out of, um, of poverty. And, and I, I, uh, we are all focused right now on, on passing legislation to meet the immediate needs of LGBTQ people and other um, marginalized communities. But we've also got our eye on what happens um, six months, two years down the road. There are some things that we know um, are like lagging indicators of, of recession and, and depressions in the economy. One of those that is particularly important for LGBT folks, and Chris touched on this a little bit earlier as well, is, is homelessness. So usually during a recession, uh, sometimes protections are put in place like are in place right now that, that prevent evictions and, and provide more services for people experiencing homelessness to get access to hotel vouchers or other uh, access to, to temporary housing. But once people, uh, once the urgency of that recession moment passes, uh, a lot of those supports and services disappear. Uh, and then we see homelessness really significantly increase six months, a year, two years down the road. Um, and so we're, we're keeping our eyes on, on that too, not just how we meet the needs of people right now, but how we meet the needs of people who are still experiencing the impacts of coronavirus or experiencing them in an even more critical way six months, two years from now when Congress has, has moved on um, and isn't thinking about what's happening right, right in this moment. Um, and that, that is just one example. There are other lagging indicators of recession, including in who gets hired and who gets fired uh, and then who gets rehired, right? So queer people, trans people, people of color, people with disabilities tend to be the first folks who are laid off 
and the last folks who are rehired. So for us, the impacts of of uh, of COVID and of recession are are impacts we're going to be feeling for for years. Um, to that point, and I I definitely think I see that extremely clearly, especially just in the world of entertainment alone. Um, you know that we many queer folks have been the the first to to be let go in and even in the context of COVID-19 and then we're going to be the last to be hired back many of the entertainers um and so uh Sharita, I have a question for you uh just kind of going based off uh what Megan said it's really clear that the coronavirus pandemic has further exacerbated many of the disparities and forms of discrimination that LGBTQ plus folks already experience around health care employment uh and housing and so what are some policies that you think our lawmakers can be pushing for that would help alleviate this? That's a great question. Um, yeah, as you said, LGBTQ people were already starting at this disadvantage because of discrimination and um, everything that the other panelists have outlined. Uh, the community is 65% um, have pre-existing conditions that make them um, more vulnerable to really severe outcomes because of this disease, but at the same time, are half as likely to be insured as non-LGBTQ people. Um, and so, you know, the, you have the medical issues, getting rid of uh, discrimination in healthcare and expanding access to healthcare are both so critical right now. Unfortunately, the Trump administration responded to the pandemic by releasing a final rule on Friday that eliminates clear and explicit prohibitions against discrimination in healthcare for transgender people, uh, eliminates protections for LGB people, and then, just for good measure, deletes protections in 10 other rules uh, for sexual orientation and gender identity protections. Um, this is abhorrent at any time, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. What we need to be doing is uh, ensuring that no matter who you are, you have access to the care that you need. Um, so in expanding Medicaid is what we should be doing. It's expanding the ability of folks to get um, coverage and ensuring that people are not denied care simply because of who they are, um, because that's going to put people at, it's endangering lives is what it's doing. Um, we also need to make sure that all of the money that Congress is allocating and states are allocating actually reaches LGBTQ people and supports them. We know that um, LGBTQ people, even before this, we're twice as likely to rely on food assistance. And for trans people and LGBTQ people of color and LGBTQ people with disabilities, those rates were even higher. We need to expand SNAP and we need to make it easier, easier to access. Uh, we mm -hmm. need to make sure that unemployment insurance is accessible to LGBTQ folks. We need to make sure that the increase and federal funding for services is not going to providers that are going to refuse to serve LGBT people just because of who they are. Uh, there's another rule the administration is putting forward that would take away non-discrimination protections in grants and services for LGBTQ people. It's just every single need our community has is being responded with, with cruelty from this administration. Um, there's a bill uh, that the House put for, passed in the House, the HEROES Act, that would introduce comprehensive non-discrimination protections based on immigration status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and other grounds to make sure that all COVID relief is accessible because you're eligible for it and that you can't be denied it simply because of who you are. And it's so critical to make sure these are enacted. Uh, and also making sure that the Equality Act is passed so that we have these uh, strong and clear protections um, even beyond the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah, and if okay, I, I would like to jump in just to mention something else that the administration hates, right? Um, which are people who want abortions. And so, you know, even when we are discussing things like the Supreme Court, um, and then what's happening at, at the federal level, one of the things that actually is happening at the court level that we're waiting on is a decision in June Medical. Um, so June Medical is a case around admitting privileges and ensuring that people have the right to reproductive health rights and justice, but in particular abortion access. Um, and, and to be very clear, this case is the same case that we heard in 2016 under uh, in Whole Woman's Health v. Hellerstedt, 
where we actually were able to get abortion care for, for people who, who deserve and need abortions. Um, but in 2016, obviously, we did not have uh, Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. Um, and so there's a lot of fear of actually what's going to happen. You know, we, we I think we were pleasantly surprised with a 6-3 decision around um, Title VII. Um, but some of us are not that that uh, confident um, that we're going to have a similar outcome with, with June Medical, though we are hoping. Uh, but I do want to underscore, right, like the reason why this is important is because we know LGBTQ people can also become pregnant, right? So what's particularly mm -hmm. damning, again, is that the Supreme Court already ruled on this. So four years later, right, it's no, it's no coincidence. Four years later, we're actually relitigating and have relitigated the same uh, case and are addressing and are waiting on that outcome. And that's particularly true because even now, as the coronavirus pandemic sweeps America and devastates communities of color, in particular, Black communities in the South and the Midwest, who already lack access to essential health care in, 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 in the best of times. Um, these efforts have been accelerated by anti-abortion extremists eager to uh, exploit this public health crisis to further chip away at abortion access. So the one thing that I always want to make clear is, you know, LGBTQ people can can be pregnant and they can also deserve the right to an abortion. So we should keep that front and center in these conversations as well. And what was the name of that, um, that June? Can you say the name of that again? Sure. June Medical. Uh, you'll see it sometimes June Medical v. Russo or v. D. Okay, is it spelled J like June, like the month? Mm-hmm, yep, and then medical. Got it. I'm taking note of that. <laughs> and, just, and, just let, and just to let viewers know, right, we, we're going to have more opinions being issued tomorrow, um, and then we're going to have a couple more days for them too. So, you know, Sharita can correct me. I know for sure there's about maybe 15 more cases left to be issued, something around there. Um, and this is certainly going to be one of them that's going to impact a lot of our communities. Mm-hmm. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, Megan, do you want to, uh, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I think uh, what Preston and Sharita said were, was everything. Mm -hmm. I have a question for all of you. I'd like you just to jump in on this, whoever feels, uh, whoever just feel free. What is one thing that you would encourage each person watching this uh, to do during Pride Month or honestly, I mean, all the time, but within the next few weeks, especially since we know that uh, the Supreme Court has just a couple weeks left to hand down all of these decisions. Uh, what is one thing that you would encourage folks to do to help advance the movement for safety, fairness, and dignity for for the LGBTQ plus community? Um, and I'll start with I'll start with Megan, but I just want to go down the line with everyone. Sure, I'd say figure out what way feels right and safe for you to plug into our democracy. Uh, if you can vote, register to vote. Um, if you if you can't vote. Uh, help the people around you register to vote uh, and take the census. The census has a real huge impact on how we uh, are represented for the next 10 years, including how much funding comes to our community for the services and supports we need. Uh, so get in there, get your democracy uh, in whatever way feels right for you. Mm -hmm. Sharita or Preston or Bambi? Um, Sure. I, I, I second everything that Megan said. Um, also, you know, the Supreme Court got us part of the way there and getting this floor of protection, but we still need the Equality Act. If you want to get involved in pushing for it to finally pass through Congress, go to AmericanProgress.org slash Equality Act and sign up. We've got a lot of actions coming this summer because, uh, you know, we know how important making sure that folks have protections that, um, meet all of their identities. As Preston Seraf saying, you know, you're not just a person of color one day and queer the next, you're all of the above. Um, and we need to make sure that our civil rights laws recognize that as well. Uh, so AmericanProgress.org slash Equality Act. Mm -hmm. And I'm That's happy to just, yeah, and I'm happy to jump in here too with, with something that we've been seeing the past couple of weeks. So during Pride Month, I encourage each person watching this to research about defunding the police and why it, uh -huh. it should be supported by LGBT people. So I'll, I'll just, uh, mm -hmm. just make this really short, uh, but recognize there's still a lot of research and work to do for folks. So in short, defunding the police is a demand to cut funding and resources from police departments and other law enforcement. 
and instead invest those things in the things that we know will create a better world of safety and dignity and fairness. So things like, again, uh, safer quality, affordable and accessible housing, affordable health care, including community based and trauma informed mental health services, uh, youth programming, living wages, etc. But I want to be very clear because defunding the police is a strategy that goes beyond dollars and cents. Um, it is really about reducing the, the size, the scope, and the power of police departments. Um, and it's about understanding that some of the greatest perpetrators of violence, um, including sexual violence, are police officers. So it's about repealing like laws that criminalize survival like sex work. It is about self-governance. It's about housing for all people. Um, and it's about re-envisioning public safety. Um, and so I just wanna provide a couple of statistics just so people can understand that it is possible to actually have community-based programs that reduce rates of violence issues. So for example, with independent studies around violence intervention programs and how they work, in some of these places, we've seen shootings be reduced at 63% in parts of New York, 30% in Philadelphia, and up to 50% in its first week of the program in Chicago. So recognizing you know, that this is a difficult conversation to have for many people, because sometimes many people can't envision a world without police and policing, right? Many of us haven't been forced to do that. Uh, but for many people, for LGBTQ people of color in particular, who are meeting at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities, we recognize fully how systemic oppression works. And that unfortunately, the people who are actually trained to de-escalate often escalate conflict among people at the intersections of race, sexual orientation, and gender identity. So I have so many resources to provide to people, but the one thing during Pride Month, right? During a month where we have, you know, but during the time in 1969 with Stonewall riots, during the fact that we know the first Pride was a riot and a protest, we need to make sure that LGBTQ people are actively listening and reading about why we should defund the police. And I think that it's really, it's, it's we can even go beyond that, Preston, uh, because, not only was pr the first Pride a riot at Stonewall, um, you know, we also have Compton's Cafeteria. We also have the Black Cat Tavern uh, in both in California. And every single one of these instances that are major moments in queer history have come from uh, an unsavory interaction with the police. And it's really important to highlight that the police have been there instigating every single time, victimizing, brutalizing, and, and, and even in those instances, it was really just a boil, uh, 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 it was a boiling up or the, the, the straw on the camel's back, if you will, of relations in that community between, tense relations in the community between the queer folks, the LGBT folks, the trans women, the drag queens uh, in those communities and the police. And, and so I think that's something that when we're talking about this as an LGBTQ issue, it's always been an LGBTQ issue. Right. Uh, and so I, I just, I'm really glad that you you mentioned that. Um, and are there any, uh, we're just about to wrap up here, but I just wanted to give everyone the opportunity to say any other thing that um, that they would like to say, you know, um, perhaps think, uh, initiatives or projects that you're working on, um, individuals that we should highlight, um, organizations that we, we can highlight, um, before we go. Or not. <laughs> Are we there? Can you hear me? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, Bambi, did you have anything? Bambi, I think, uh, may not be with us on the chat any longer. Okay. Uh, from what I hear. Oh, wait, is Bambi back? Bambi, uh, please come back in. Bambi is here. Um, so if Bambi's here, I'm going to bring you back in. Let's welcome Bambi back in. And I'd like Bambi to answer. Uh, I'd like to have a conversation with Bambi a little bit if we can. I'm not sure if we're having technical difficulties. I'm not able to hear. Bambi, is there anything we can do in the control room to get her on screen? Okay, it looks like we may be having some technical difficulties, but it's worth trying to figure this out one more time. So viewers, please stick with us. It's, Bambi has a really important perspective and we need to hear from Bambi. 
Oh, wait, maybe that's Bambi now or now. Okay, so let's go to Megan in the meantime. Um, Megan, will you tell us a little bit about any other initiatives or organizations? Uh, take it while we try to uh, talk to Bambi and get the tech figured out. Yeah, sure. And it, it does sound like Bambi is trying to get on, but the audio is uh, jumbled. So please, Bambi, as soon as you're back, um, happy to shut up. Uh, <laughs> um, I think another, some of the other pieces we're, we're working on, as Sharita had mentioned, um, are, oh, it looks like Bambi's back. Is your audio back to Bambi? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Oh, um, hi everyone. Um, I don't know what happened. I was listening to everything and all of a sudden you could not hear me or see me. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but I do want to say a couple of things and I know that we're short on time. Um, and I want to respond to the question of pride. Um, and I do want to obviously remind everyone that June is only 30 days and that's, you know, categorized as Pride Month, but it's important that we understand that we need to be proud every single day of the year um, and celebrate ourselves every day as people, as a community and as individuals. Um, and I also want to, you know, just really be reminded about uh, the importance of organizing, right? The importance of building the infrastructure of trans, the trans community really, right? Um, again, I mentioned earlier that with this global pandemic, the trans community is gonna be even further behind than how we were in 2020, right? Um, I know that Megan was mentioning about homelessness and the things that we're gonna experience post um, the pandemic, right? And the truth is that, you know, there's a lot of things that need to happen in order to really support to continue to build the infrastructure of the trans community. Uh, it is unfortunate that in the last five years we have gained some momentum and trans people are coming into our power. And then we have this horrible pandemic that is obviously impacting everyone, the whole world, but understanding that trans people are one of the most marginalized communities, right? Um, and believe it or not, we're gonna be set behind even further, right? And so um, I want to encourage for all of us to really understand what that means for all of us, for all the LGBTQ community, but also understand what that means for trans people and particularly black uh, and Latinx and immigrants and multilingual Spanish speakers and undocumented. Um, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I also want to uh, remind everyone, right? Because, you know, we're talking about like federal policies and federal laws and the Supreme Court and all of that, but there's multiple ways that people can get involved in, in creating those changes, right? Like get involved in your local government, get involved in knowing who your representative is, get involved in getting to know who your either council members or supervisors or however they call them in your localities are, right? And influence in that way. Uh, connect with local organizations who are doing really great work. Um, and also obviously national organizations, right? Um, but it really is important for us to like influence at the local level and also at the national level. I know mm -hmm. the people talking about defunding the police and that is something that, you know, it is becoming a reality. And it's right now, it's um, it's gonna be unstoppable. And so I think that the reality is for us to think about what are we going to do? How are we going to be involved into making sure that we hold our elected officials accountable and they do the right thing um, and really to support people, right? Because they are in office to support people. There's public servants. And so we need to hold them accountable and make sure that we enforce um, for them to do what they're supposed to do. Um, so again, thank you. And I apologize for, you know, the 
I don't know what happened, but I was listening to everything that everyone was saying. Um, and uh, I really, you know, I, I'm hopeful, although, you know, I do want to say trans people have been oppressed, marginalized, and, you know, discriminated against for centuries, right? Um, we are resilient people and I have confidence and I'm hopeful that we are going to overcome. Uh, so I want to at least give the bit of hope for people to really um, not get discouraged, but rather be empowered and understand our individual and collective power and how we can make sure that we move things um, around and that we hold our, the people who is in power accountable for everybody, like the most marginalized lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna say thank you so much, Bambi. I'm really sorry for those uh, technical difficulties that we had. And I wanna do a quick thank you, first off to each of our uh, panelists, uh, Megan, Preston, Sharita, and Bambi, of course. And a very special thank you to Times Up, the Times Up Foundation, Equal Rights Advocates, and Moms Rising. Um, we are running very short on time, so I want to make sure we get all the thank yous and acknowledge uh, to everyone that was watching. This, this was a first step. Some of you may be already involved in sort of the act, uh, activism or legislat la legislative space, um, but you don't have to already be in those spaces in order to continue or, or, or contribute to the fight. As some of our panelists have said, um, it's really important that we each kind of sort of self-examine our relationship to homophobia, transphobia, racism, uh, xenophobia, misogyny, um, and understand that we each have some connection to those things, and we can we can do something in some small way. And so, uh, hopefully, this is the beginning of a longer conversation. We encourage you to have these conversations with people in your families, people at work, uh, in a safe way, of course, uh, keeping keeping certain that you are safe and not in, to, in jeopardy, but also at the same time realizing that there may be some uncomfortable conversations ahead. And those are the first ways and first steps to um, really making sure that people were all on the same page. Uh, for now, thank you so much once again to Time's Up Foundation, Equal Rights Advocates and Mom Rising, uh, and to everyone who's watched this, my name is Peppermint, um, and please continue the conversation. Everyone have a wonderful Pride and a safe rest of 2020. <laughs> Bye.